I, my friend, I bring you greetings in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank God for the opportunity that we have to be alive today. More than anything, that God has given us the grace to share in his word. <clears throat> today, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, my desire is to share with us on how we overcome obstacles. My plan will be to show us what obstacles are, where they come from, and to find out if there is any advantage to obstacles when they come into the life of the saints. And then, of course, we're going to look at the practical aspect of how to overcome obstacles. Today, I'm going to be reading from the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. I will start the reading from chapter verse 6. And it says, So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground, then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless, God bless it. And one thing that I want to begin to say first of all, is that obstacles are like mountains in our lives. And when they show up, they stand in the way of God's plan and purposes for us. And sometimes, except the Lord comes in to our defense and destroys those mountains, those mountains actually could become severe hindrances on our part. The first question that I would love to ask myself or try to answer today is, what is obstacle? And an obstacle is basically an obstruction. It's a hindrance. It's a sort of impediment, which infers in its sense something that uh, interferes or prevents any action or progress. Sometimes they could be material or non-material. They could stand in our way literally or even emotionally or spiritually. Basically, they are like mountains. You want to get from point A to point B, but obstacles suddenly show up. They become a huge mountain that we have to uh, overcome as we attempt to get to the place where God may want us to be. So many things in the life of a saint may become an obstacle. It may be physical, it may be emotional, it may be spiritual, it may be visible or invisible. Sometimes they may be provoked by us, and sometimes it may not be provoked by us. This evening, I think one big part that I would really love to start talking about is the fact that the biggest form of obstacle to the growth of a saint is sin. When we look at the nature of sin as an obstacle, we will find certain characteristics in it. Sin is an obstacle against life. According to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, hear what the scripture says. It says, the one who sins is the one who will die. That's the big part of the story. I know there's more to this passage. It says the child shall not share the guilt of the parents, nor will the parents share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. But I want you to hear the first phrase, that this, the one who sins is the one who will die. Sin by itself carries death as a, as, as a form of its consequence when it has influence in the life of a person. And I can also confirm today that God's desire for his children is for them to have life and have it abundantly. When sin comes into the life of a saint, 
that sin becomes an obstacle to the ability of the saint to thrive and have abundant life. Therefore, the apostle, when he was writing the book, the book of Romans, it says it is not possible for grace to grow while we are in sin. It is grace that we have life. It is grace by itself that you and I have life. And it's also grace that we are able to be called the children of God. But when sin comes into the life of the saints, it plays its role as an obstacle. And therefore, we are restricted from living a life of abundance, even though we are supposed to live under the grace of God. This is one thing you want to hear from this. One of the effective characteristics of sin is that sin acts as an effective obstacle. It keeps its victims bound. Basically, sin becomes an obstacle to our ability and desire to become who Christ has called us and made us to be. I want you to know that Christ died for our sins, which is very true. And as a part of his death, he set us free to be able to live our lives as the children of God and then be his ambassadors here on earth. And that is why Galatians chapter five, verse one tells us, it says simply, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore stand and then do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So Christ died so that we will have the freedom to live as the children of God. Of course, there's so much tied to the idea of being the children of God. When we did not know the Lord, we were slaves to sin. We were unable to do the things that we desire. We were unable to please God. And then Christ died to set us free from this bondage so that we may become free to do what the will of God is. And this is why in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, beginning from verse 15 to 22, this is what the apostle has to say. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. And just as you used to offer yourselves to slaves, yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness that leads to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you are free from the control of righteousness. That's so interesting. What this passage is trying to tell you and I is this, that when sin comes in, it literally takes away our freedom and it keeps us from the ability to live as children of the light. And of course, Righteousness will not have its ability to walk in us. And the apostle actually tries to mention the anguish as seen as an obstruction to our freedom. Hear how he puts it here in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. From verse 14, he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am on spiritual. I have been sold a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, that's what I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who does it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. 
that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. That's what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who does it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work in me. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me. That's wages war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am who rescue me from this body that is subject to death. So you can see what we are saying here, that there is an obstacle to our ability to be who we desire to be. There is, an up, there is, a, there, there is a hindrance to our ability to live the life that Christ died for upon the cross of Calvary. And the reason this is this, that when sin comes alive in the life of a saint, it, it keeps its fang and its claw around the life of the saint and makes it impossible for the saint to walk effectively in what Christ has died for. Another aspect of sin is that sin is an effective obstacle to an efficient worship of God. The, book, the writer of Hebrew puts it like this in verse 12 from verses 14 to 17. He says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single male sold his inheritance right as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit these blessings, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessings with tears, he could not change what he had done. And, and what, what we are looking at here is that it is impossible to see the Lord without holiness. And when sin comes in, it makes our worship very inefficient. Oftentimes, we get to that stage in life when sin is having its opportunity in our lives, Christianity becomes a drudgery. It becomes a burden. We want to move. We want to pray. But like it just looks as if we are attempting to pull a tooth with our hand. When sin is there, it is able to hinder our efficiency in the worship of God. Although Christ has paid for our sins fully and has made us the righteousness of God in him, what he did was that he took our guilt upon himself so that we now have become guiltless in the sight of God. I want you to hear this, that one of the things that sin does when it comes alive in the life of the saints is that it brings, over, brings up again past guilt. The things we have been forgiven the sins that have been washed away, the guilt rises up again. And you know what happens when there's guilt? The sinner runs. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the apostle says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. And one way that seems Attempts to hinder the sacrifice of God is to bring alive the power of guilt again. A guilty person cannot stand in worship in the presence of God because sin brings about guilt and, and makes you feel that the sin that you committed has come back again. Actually, it makes the individual forget that their sins have been forgiven and then they begin to run away. Another major obstacle that a saint may face is the satanic obstacle. The Bible calls Satan our adversary and the accuser of the saints. He walks day and night to hinder us as the children of God. And, and anything that he can do 
to hinder us from enjoying the freedom that Christ has paid for with his blood. He will try to throw every obstacle across our path. These are his characteristics. The scripture calls him the opposer of the saint. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, the apostle wrote that he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And most of the time, the devil is working to hinder our worship of God, to hinder our holiness, to hinder our perseverance in the face of sin, to hinder our faith, to hinder our blessings. I'd like to show you two situations, and you will notice that the devil was at work in those situations. In the book of Daniel, the scripture recalls that Daniel was a righteous man, yet the devil still hindered a quick response to his prayers. I just asked myself this question. How many saints have given up not knowing that the hindrance that they are facing in their life is not because of their sin or something that is not in place in their life, but because Satan has found a way to hinder their blessings? Unfortunately, a lot of saints are lulled into sleep by the Satan. They don't realize that the devil is the one hindering their prayer lives. Some of them think, well, it's because the economy is bad. Some of them think, well, it is because right now there's a disease that is taking over humankind. Yet, when the saint really takes the time to slow down, they will realize that the obstacle in their life it's not something that is just natural. And like Daniel, we should take on the mantle of prayer. Daniel did not wait after he said he sought to know what the will of God is, was for Israel, and the response didn't come. He said he spent 21 days fasting and praying to ask for what the will of God is. In Daniel chapter 20, verses 12 to 14, this is what the angel told Daniel. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. Hear this. From the very first day that Daniel prayed, Apparently, God sent a response to his prayers. But the prayer did not get that response because the devil held back the man or the one who was supposed to bring that message to him. In verse 13, he says, But the prince of Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief priests, princes came to me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision consigns a time yet to come. It is important for you to understand this aspect. Daniel's prayer was able to move things in the spiritual realm. Angel Gribel was hindered. On the other hand, Daniel on earth insisted through prayers because he understood that God is a God who answers prayers. He understood God is a faithful God. He did not allow things to discourage him. He did not allow the lies of Satan to pollute his mind. Rather, he trusted in the God that he had prayed to. And his prayer influenced activities in the heavenly realm, so much so that the prince Michael came and undertook for him, and thereby the result of his prayer came to him. Before I go, I just wanted to ask myself, what is really happening to the life of a lot of saints? When we put certain things before God and we quickly get tired and we quickly get discouraged, and we quickly give up those things because their results don't come. And peradventure, if we would just slow down to push in 
to, to wait a little bit on God. We might have known that God is a faithful God. He has sent his message to us. He has responded to our prayer. Maybe the enemy is the one that is hindering those prayers. I want to also tell my friends who may say, Satan cannot hinder our prayers. It is written here in black and white that the prince of Persia resisted Gabriel from taking God's message to Daniel. Hear what the apostle Paul has to say here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 to 8, it says, but brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. <laughs> I mean, this is the Apostle Paul. This man is responsible for a major part of the New Testament epistles. This man, God used him to open doors in so many aspects during the revival, after the Holy Spirit came down, God used the same man to raise the dead. God used this man for so many things. And you will think, well, he's an apostle. The devil won't mess up with him. But this is the apostle saying, I wanted to come to you. I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan blocked our ways. I want you to know, my dear saints, my dear friends, that sometimes we probably give up so quickly, we become bitter, we become embittered, we say God does not really care. I have had somebody before say, well, it looks like God doesn't really care. Well, I want you to know that God cares. And sometimes the enemy may just be the one that is hindering you. Carnality is another thing that hinders us and becomes an obstacle, it could become a mountain to our destiny and to the destination that God has set apart for us. There's a constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh that is not subdued will always hinder the same from living the life that God has kept for him to the fullest. The flesh is another huge obstacle to our faith. It creates a distorted image of God. It highlights only the things that are based upon feeling, even though they are not real things that endure for eternity. The flesh creates an appetite in us that becomes an obstacle to looking onto Jesus for our sustenance. It hinders us from pleasing God. It is an obstacle to our overall faith. The flesh produces in us the things that obstructs and defiles our worship. Sometimes when we saints are found in this place, we actually attempt to legalize our behaviors. This is what the Apostle Paul has to say in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 8. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit, they have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind that is governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And those who are in the realm of the flesh, they cannot please God. And so you see what I'm saying is this. The moment we have been saved and translated from darkness into light and moved into God's eternal kingdom, if we resort to the, the, the dependence on our flesh again or carnality again, we become God's enemy. And not only do we become, it becomes impossible for us to please God. Literally, an obstacle is lifted up in our lives that makes it completely impossible for us to submit to God. We are not going to be able to worship God as we desire in our heart because the flesh will always contend 
with the spirit. It's a good place for the saint to take a pause and just ask certain questions. Why is it very hard for me to enjoy my worship, to enjoy my fellowship with God, to enjoy my prayer life? Perhaps there is an obstacle. Perhaps that obstacle is coming because the flesh has come alive in our mind, in our spirit again. According to Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21, it says, so walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, walk by the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. You remember what Jesus Christ was telling his disciple and the woman by the by the well in the book of John chapter 4, he says, a time comes when we will no longer worship God in Jerusalem or in Judea. He says, the true worshipers of God will worship God in spirit and in truth. But the problem is this, there is a battle between the spirit and the flesh. And when the spirit is given the opportunity to be stronger and to rule, it will be impossible for us to please God in the spirit. Hear what the apostle says here in 18. He says, if you are led by the spirit, then you are no longer under the law. And then he went further to enumerate the things that come from the flesh. He said, the acts of the flesh are very obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, faction and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. And he went on to conclude to say, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Basically, if this, if this flesh, carnality, is an obstacle in the life of a saint, and the saint is unrepented, you will not be able to please God. I'd like to answer this question. Do obstacles have any advantages that come with them? Yes, they do. They do have. The reason is simple, because we know that all things work well for good. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the apostle says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Those who have been called according to his purpose. When the scripture says all things, even my life, when it is in danger, yes. Even when my honor is in jeopardy, yes. Even when my prayer response is delayed, yes, in all things. It is easy to understand when we surrender to the sovereignty of God. This is what it says. With God, nothing is impossible. Because he is powerful, he is eternal, and he does not change. Therefore, we can trust him even in the darkest time and the deepest and the hardest obstacles in our lives. And so you may be struggling with sin, you may be battling with Satan, you may be battling with obstacles, you may be battling with people. I really believe that the solution is not to succumb to that obstacle because all things will work together for our good. We are dealing with a God who is capable of making a way through the Red Sea, a God who is able to allow water to come out of the rock if that is what the need is. And if the need is food, he is able to allow food come from heaven to feed you directly. But the question is this, you must be brave, you must be courageous. You cannot allow yourself to fall down to this obstacle. The beauty is this, when obstacles show up in our life, they can be used to produce the fruits of good character in us. In Romans chapter five, verses one to five, this is what the apostle said. He says, therefore we have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, we also glory in our sufferings 
And we can put this there. We also glory in our obstacles. We also glory in the mountains. We also glory in the problems that we confront. We also glory in our sickness because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It is important that we understand that even in difficult times, all things work well for the good of those who love God. I like the way the Apostle, Paul, Apostle Peter puts this. In the, in the book of 1 Peter chapter 6, verses 6 to 9, chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, it says, in all things, in all these things, you greatly rejoice. Though for now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I mean, in all kinds of trials. Whether it is wrestling with sin, whether it's wrestling with the adversary, whether it's wrestling with other saints, whether it's wrestling with unbelievers, in all things. He says, you greatly rejoice. Number verse seven says, these things have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, in glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The Apostle Peter is going about here saying, look, all of these things, they are designed to test the genuineness of your faith. What faith do we have when we are confronted with sin and we are not able to fight with it, no matter how hard it may be. When we give up so easily, what faith can we say that we have? What faith do we have when we are confronted by demonic attacks, when people reject us, when brothers malign us? What type of faith can we say we have? The Apostle Peter is saying that this testing should result in praise, in glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's not saying that people should praise you, that people should glorify you or honor you. He's saying when Jesus Christ himself shows up, you should be able to get praise, glory, and honor from him. And verse 8, he said, though you may not have seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with an inexplicable, inexpressible, and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. That means the salvation of your soul. Basically he's saying, just holding on, holding on, holding on to the end, trusting in God through the troubles that you may be confronting, you are guaranteeing that you will receive salvation for your soul. My dear friends, obstacles may produce suffering, but the essence of such hindrance is to try our faith so that we will not be found deficient in any way. That is why the apostle encourages us to rejoice even in our suffering. And recently, I have begun to add to my prayers, thanksgiving to the God of delay in my life. Obstacles are used to produce humility in us so that we do not fall. The Lord knows our substance very well. He knows that without the blood of Jesus, our tendency will always be towards sin. And therefore, present, prevent us from falling. He allows certain obstacles in our life. He also makes a way for us to escape from such obstacle. From the book of 2 Corinthians, we see how the apostle encouraged the saint in chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. He says, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heavens. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise and had inexpressible things. Things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that. But I will not boast about myself, except about my weakness. Even if I should choose to boast, I will not be a fool. Because 
I'll be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of this surpassing great revelation. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly about my weakness boast, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The apostle wanted to encourage you and I, and he warned us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That song says, God will make a way when there is no way. Practically, how are we supposed to deal with obstacles? The first thing that we are supposed to do with obstacles is to learn to surrender our burden unto the Lord. According to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28 to 29, this is what he has to say. Christ says, come unto me all that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am weak and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your soul. My dear friends, the message here is very simple. The first place to succeed with our obstacle is to be willing to give it to Jesus. He's able to carry the obstacle. He already won the battle on the cross of Calvary. He nailed our sins to the cross. He, he destroyed the power of Satan and made a public display of him. And so for you and I, when we come, confront any obstacle, whether we confront sin, whether it is demonic, attack against us, whether it is battles from the bedroom, let us take this burden, let us take this obstacle and take it to Jesus. Do not let us try to solve this burden by ourselves. That is the first and the most important thing. Oftentimes, this is the way saints do it. We become discouraged. We, we start to fight the battle by ourselves in our own flesh. And even then, we're not going anywhere. We become frustrated. We become bitter and hateful of what God has not done or what he has done. And at the end of the day, it is the devil who is winning the battle. The first thing is count your blessings and take your burden on to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will give you rest. Let me read this to you. What the apostle says in chapter 4 of First Peter chapter 12, verse 18. Dear friend, do not be surprised at the very ordeal that has come on to test you. As though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed to you. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a mother of thieves, or any other kind, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and to do good continually. I'd like to summarize this to you saints. Number one, do not be surprised at whatever ordeal or obstacles you are confronting. Number two, do not give too much importance to the ordeal or the obstacles you are facing. Don't let that be the crux of your life. Worship God. Continue on the path that he has for you. 
Number three, your ordeal or obstacle is not new. Ordeals will come, they will go. But the victory of God stands sure. Remember that. Number four, I want you to know that Christ, the champion of your salvation, has gone through obstacles. But he did not allow that obstacle to hold him back. Number five, you have been given the privilege to share in the suffering of Jesus Christ. It is a phenomenal thing to share in his suffering because if we do, we will reign with him. I encourage you, dear friends, you must be strong and courageous. Have faith in God. Like the Lord told Zerubbabel through the prophet, he says, who is this mountain that stands? He said, it shall become leveled. And I tell you that the God that will serve will level every mountain that is on our path. I do not know what you are confronting right now, but I can assure you, there is no mountain too high for God to overcome because he is highly lifted above every mountain. I pray today that as you begin to meditate on this word, that your heart will be encouraged to know that Christ has won the battle for you. Every mountain upon your path shall be leveled in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray that this week you will not be bitter anymore or allow the weight of this obstacle to wear you down. You will rejoice in the fact that Christ also suffered as you have suffered. May the Lord of hosts, the King of kings, the Redeemer of our soul, bless you. May his light shine upon you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, I have prayed. Amen. As I bring this sermon to an end, I would like to share the grace of God with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of God forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you. May his light shine upon you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.